Hello. Hello, Instagram. Hello, I think Facebook this week too. Hello. Hi. How is everybody? I am here in the gathering room just waiting for, oh, nope. It's already started. Anna's here, or no, Anne. And Stephanie is here, yes. Hi, guys. Nomad Rose and Coconuts View. <sighs> Baba Squirrel, Lucky Lotus. Oh, wow. Dr. Donna. There's Tracy. And we've got Facebook up. Woohoo! Everybody's coming in. Vale is here. And Catherine and Christina. Hi, Christina. There's Jessica and Dawn. And um, yeah, let's let's roll, scroll that up, man. Um, oh, so lovely to see you all here. There's Jill and Trisha and another Stephanie and lots and lots of wonderful people. I'm looking around. For, oh, oh, okay. We've almost got enough people to start. It's so exciting. I, I hope you all um, got over the Facebook issue last time I broadcast this. I, I, I must speak to you of it because it pertains to what we are doing here today, what we're talking about. It looks like we've got enough people, so yay! Let's start with Deborah and Noreen and Jules and Nikki and a couple of Karens, a couple of the three Karens. All right. Today on The Gathering Room, we are talking about hanging on by letting go because... That is what we've been thinking about in our house. We are doing something very, very uh, fraught. I would say fraught. We are potty training a two-year-old. And we are using a methodology that is kind of all or nothing. It's in this wonderful book called Oh Crap by, uh, let me get make sure I, by Jamie Cloacki. Yes, it's called Oh Crap uh, Potty Training. And basically, this woman is so funny and smart and loving and good and in every way. It's a fantastic book, and I encourage you to use it if you are not yet potty trained. But it's a very all-in kind of strategy. Like, we literally cleared our calendars, rolled up a rug in a room with a wooden floor, put a cage around the room, got everything up, filled it with old towels, then took the baby in. There, there's plastic potty, strip her down, let it go. Let it go, yes. She has to learn to let it go at a certain time and place. And the idea is, this, this methodology is once you've started, you cannot stop. <laughs> I mean, you can, but you shouldn't. The, Jamie Cloacki even quotes Yoda saying, there is no, do or don't do, there is no try. Okay, so there's this method, there's no try. We do it or we don't do it. Well, of course, we have this amazing little girl. And um, so far as we know, she'll tell us when she's older. Um, but she caught on really quickly. You know, she got it that she was going to get a lot of praise for, for noticing when she needed to go and then heading over there, depositing the deposit. And then we all celebrate. We have a huge celebration as we take the plastic potty to pour it out in the other potty. Isn't this just exactly what you wanted to be talking about today? This is life. It's gritty. It's it's gnarly. But I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so first day, everything went amazingly. Second day. Now, Jamie says, and Jamie is basically our new leader. Jamie says, the second day you may encounter some resistance. Because the first day, it's fun. And the second day, they're like, Really? So, and it's also the day you start putting their clothes back on them, and then they have to, this additional step of having to disrobe. They can balk at pretty much any point along the path from wearing your clothing to taking off your lower clothing to getting to the right destination to letting it go as it were. Okay. Yeah, this one, it was going so swimmingly. But let me tell you something. This methodology is very tiring. It even says, Jamie says, Jamie, our new leader says, you will have, no, this will be the tiredest you've ever been in your life. And I'm like, all right, game on. Oh, yeah. 
because you watch them constantly. That's how you start to pick up tiny little cues. You're like, you're like Sherlock Holmes staring at one child for like 12 hours straight, looking for any little twitch of expression or body posture or anything that means I'm ready to make a deposit. So you're staring at this kid constantly and there are false alarms. Then, okay, now we're getting accidents now. And by noon today, it was just, it looked bad. It looked bad. There were lots of piles of wet clothing around. The, the towels had all gone into the laundry. There were none left. Yeah. And at that point, I was thinking about how deeply I've internalized the idea that we should never give up, ever give up, never, ever, ever give up. The problem was we were all completely and totally exhausted. So after a few minutes of hanging on a little bit, we let go. We basically, the baby went down for her nap. Lila went down for her nap. We went and lay down and reread the instructions from Jamie's book. And it turned out that the troubleshooting one, the troubleshooting chapters prepare, would have prepared us for what we were going through, except that we hadn't read those chapters yet. So we read them. And what they said is, you will need rest. You will need restitution. You will need to build back up. So when you start, and there is no tr there is no try, there is only do it or don't do it, what that means is you're gonna do something important that you need to stick to in the long run. And anything worth sticking to in the long run is probably gonna be complex. It's going to be long-term. It's going to have to follow the rhythm of your life. So you can apply this. Yes, I'm applying it to potty training, a very important life skill, but it's also your life's work, you know, whatever that is. If you're a doctor, or if you're a, you know, an architect, if whatever you do, writing a book is very much like this. Any relationship worth having, child, parent, parent, uncle, like <laughs> sibling, anything is worth giving a lot of long-term effort to a complex thing. So the point of all this is that when people tell you never to give up, we're missing a crucial step and it's in all the spiritual traditions of the world. Surrender, hmm. like I've never said that before. Um, we come back to it over and over and over again. But to me, surrender used to mean giving up for good. I was going to play you guys a snippet of a song, and then I had to restrain from that for copyright reasons. This song is on YouTube, and I encourage you to look at it. it. It's a fabulous young woman who takes popular songs and then runs them through Google Translate several times. So she'll send it from like Chinese to Macedonian to Russian to Urdu and back to English. And then she sings the song as whatever comes out of that process. So I was listening listening to the song from Frozen, which you may have heard. It's called Let It Go. And it's this anthem of liberation and capacity. It's this woman just deciding she's not gonna be restrained anymore. And she sings, let it go, let it go. It's this swelling chorus. And this, after going through Google Translate, it comes out and this woman sings it beautifully. Give up, give up, give up. Let it go means give it up. And, but how do you give it up? How do you surrender and still never ever stop trying? Because one thing I've learned is that if something is meant to be, you actually can't let go of it. It's got you. So for example, um, like I, sometimes I have book ideas that I think maybe I'll do that. Maybe I won't, but I don't get to say because I don't have the idea. The idea has me. It compels me, it pushes me. Same thing with, with art, with um, travel, with anything actually. There are times when um, you would like to just, as, they, as it says in the good book, you'd like to curse God and die. And then you don't die. It, and it just keeps going. The, the situation's still there. The child is still making doo-doo or whatever. And you still need to live a life where that's contained, okay? So this is the thing, you surrender again and again and again and again and again to the same thing. And that means that implies that you have to pick it up or join with it 
again and again and again and again and again. If something's truly worth doing, um, like for example, the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment, you will, you will give it up and then you will find that you don't have it, it has you. And it picks you back up and it starts you in again. And you, there is no try, you do or don't do, you try and try, you do and do, see I'm slipping, you do and do and do, and then you can't do anymore and you surrender and you drop, sort of let go, and then it picks you up again. Uh, Leonard Cohen wrote about this in an angry song to God. He wrote a lot of beautiful angry songs to God. And one of them, um, he says, well, why do you, uh, why did you call me here tonight? Why do you bother with my heart at all? You pick me up in grace and then you put me in a place where I fall. And so he's singing this to God. And it's like, everything we're doing here as humans is like that. We're picked up by grace and we think it's all gonna work. And then we're put in a place where we fall again. And we just have to keep trying to get, see, I used the try word. I'm not supposed to. Jamie says, never use the word try. Jamie also says, and I love this woman with my whole heart, like always watch your child, but never hover. <laughs> Make firm suggestions, but ask no questions, but figure out when they're going to pee, but don't, don't put any pressure on yourself or them. So it's, I'm going to keep trying this methodology, just like I'm going to keep trying to write my books, just like I'm going to keep trying to meditate my way into complete stillness, just like I'm going to try to be a loving human being. Again and again and again, I'm going to be in the place where I fall. And then I wait for everything to go quiet and the thing picks me up again and on I go. And I came to a methodology that I wanted to tell you guys about because I was, sorry, you folks about, see, I am shifting the word guy, which is gendered to folks, which is folksy, but I always make a mistake, but I pick myself up. Okay, I give up on that one. Nope, here it is again. Can't give up, it's got me. So I was thinking about it and I I've, think I've told you folks, I think I've told you folks before about Anita Morjani's advice on how to get to joy from wherever you are. She told it to me. I don't know if she's ever written it down, but it's brilliant. And it pertains to any time you're doing something that, it, that has you, you can actually not put it down because it has you. It's like trying to fall out of love with someone when you're in love with them. The emotion has you. You get to choose your actions, but that feeling, you can't give it up but you can surrender to the situation. So what do you do when that happens? Because you're gonna be very attached. If it's important to you, you're gonna want it very much. The whole culture is telling you never, ever, ever, ever stop trying. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Um, quitters never win, winners never quit. So you're hanging on, you're like exhausted and stressed, and then you fall. <laughs> At that moment, it can feel like a crisis, a catastrophe. There were moments, today, this very day, when we lay on a, a bare wooden floor, surrounded by piles of peepee -pee cloths, weeping inconsolably. But the project has us, we don't have the project. So I thought, I'm gonna use Anita's method and here's how it goes. When you can't hang on and you've just fallen, you give up by accepting that you are where you are. All right. I literally cannot watch this child without without my attention drifting for another 10 minutes. Like we, we were trying to take it in shifts because it is so hard to pay continuous attention, even if you don't have ADD, which I do. But okay, I can't pay attention anymore. I can't do the process anymore. I can't follow Jamie's wonderful book anymore. And I can't get out of the situation. All right. Ah, uh, that's how it is. So what if I stop pretending it's anything else? All right, this sucks and it's happening. Ah, uh, sucks and it's happening. Okay, you try to relax with it sucks and it's happening so that the feelings go through you so that you can, when it's something really devastating, you can go through the grieving process um, for one more pair of wet pants. Uh, you. You can sleep, you can rest, you can be okay with what is. At that point, when you're in acceptance, it's just one more step over to peace. 
So if you're in a situation right now where you've given up and you can just temporarily, like it has you, but you can't hang on. So you've given up and you're in surrender. Go from acceptance and see if you can breathe your way into peace. You can actually go, well, okay. It sucks, but I've, I've had it worse. You know, things get better. All right. Whatever it takes to get you into a state of peace with what's happening. Not excitement, joy, thrills. It's all good. No, just, okay, peace. Now, once you're in peace, you can start to go to gratitude. So during Lila's nap today, I sat around and played a game called, what is the upside of this downside? And so, and, and we parents were talking amongst ourselves in the house. And I said, what is the upside of the downside? And Rose said, okay, here's an upside. I really get it that I can't just clear out three days, get my child potty trained and move on with my brilliant career, unless that's good for her. Instead, I, I need to put everything else on hold because she's the most important thing. And it shouldn't be just three days until she's potty trained that she's the most important thing. I'm feeling all this love and connection to my daughter. And I was like, that's a very good upside of the downside. And I had the same thing. In fact, the very difficulty of going back and forth and trying to get things done, I could feel it bonding all of us. Like I used to say, even as a teenager, I remember thinking um, uh, human connection is the source, is the result of shared endeavor. And as we endeavor, all of us, we're bonding together as a family. So I'm grateful for that. Suddenly, now you can feel your mood just coming up a tiny bit with gratitude. From gratitude, you can get to appreciation, right? Like, wow, we get, we have a room with a rug we can roll up and a little cage to put around the room. We we can read Jamie's book. We have so many things. I'm so appreciative of that. This is amazing. Now my mood's starting to go up. And then it it's just a little hop to joy. Like we started laughing again. We started, we resigned ourselves to the struggle. We reminded ourselves that it can't always be perfect. And we were up in the task again. So that the next time we give up, we'll be this much further. And it's not going to stop until it's done. There is no try. There is only fall down, <laughs> except get to peace, get to gratitude, get to appreciation, get to joy, and then go back again. So let's look at these questions for today. Yay! Anne says, hello, Martha. What's the difference between acceptance and surrender? You know, it's a, it's a fine, it's a razor's edge here, but I would say that surrender is where you're like, ah! <laughs> where acceptance is like, eh. I hope that clears it up. <laughs> I read that in a book somewhere. Ah! So surrender to me is where, in the times I've really surrendered in my, in my life, I was so battered and so attached to what I wanted that it had to be almost a literal falling down. In fact, it was a literal falling down. Like I would work so hard and sleep so little and care so much. The biggest time that I'm always referring to was when I accepted that my, my little guy, Adam, who was still on board, had Down syndrome. And I was really ill and really grief stricken. And I literally fell down and I surrendered. And in that moment, I had a very intense mystical experience, which you can read about in Expecting Adam, if you haven't already. Um, it was like, it was definitely like an angel came in. But I literally, I had to have no energy left at all. I was 25. That lesson was there for me since then. And I've let go a little bit more easily as the years have gone by. Um, nevertheless, I was deeply depressed today about the whole pee, -pee situation. So yeah, it always comes back. And I found that, ah! and lay down. And then I accept it. That's just how I see it. Emily says, how do we remain patient? I am doing my best to heal from extreme fatigue, from lack of sleep, adrenal fatigue, complex PTSD, anxiety, and chronic pain. Been there, done that. I get so frustrated with bad days, especially after having several good days. Oh, I so know that feeling the hope, the joy, maybe I'm going to be normal again. Maybe it's going to be, I can just do things that other people do. Oh my gosh. And then it's taken away 
bam, and it hurts more every single time. And you're right, it gets worse because it's been better. So I, for one, did not remain patient. In fact, patience, I think I was trying too hard to be patient for a while. Um, but this situation of letting yourself fall, as I said, when it's something really serious, like what Emily's dealing with, it's not just, oh, there are peep claws everywhere. We're going to deal with it. It's, it's really, it requires grieving. Like here's the pain back again. I don't know when it's going to go away. I don't know if it's going to go away this time. I don't know what it is. I don't understand. Why am I not like other people? I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And you have to grieve that. And you have to practice kind internal self-talk. You have to talk to yourself and say, you've been through this before. You're not sure of the reason, but it's worth grieving. It's worth, and part of the grieving cycle is anger. You can pound a pillow, you can scream, you can call a friend and say, it's not fair. Call somebody else who's got problems like you're on and commiserate and, and throw tantrums. Like you can just lie there in your bed, completely immobilized by pain, throwing a total mental tantrum as long as you don't get attached to the darkness of that. When you finally get the pain out, there's this moment of, <sighs> and you see this with little kids or dogs or whatever who are, are trying to do something and they're having a tantrum thing. It, like if, you, if a dog can't get what it's want, it wants, it'll try and try and try and then go, <sighs> and that's its nervous system readjusting. And I've noticed this when I meditate, if I'm in a, a frantic mindset uh, or I'm angry or something, it'll go and go and go and go and go and I don't stop it. And then <sighs> my body resets itself and it's not something I do deliberately. I just allow my feelings until it happens. And it's kind of cool that it does happen and it's so noticeable now. So that's what I'd say, don't be patient, go ahead and have your tantrums, but also don't get attached to the tantrum it won't work. There's this thing of if I scream loudly enough, it'll work. Nah, eventually you're gonna go <sighs> and then it's time for acceptance, then go to peace, then go to gratitude, then go to appreciation, then go to joy and you're back in business even if you're still lying there in pain. I've done it a million times. My read says, does this work with breakups? Yes, indeed it does. It's more complex because um, the other person is putting energy into the equation. So there might be somebody hanging on even if you want to surrender. And that may keep you in the game a little bit longer. And it makes it even more difficult and painful and confusing. At the end of the day, the way to heal from in any relationship, the way to get out of codependency is to go by yourself and feel what you feel about it. And that feeling may be like, I'm ready to surrender this relationship. It's just too much. I can't hang on. You get to have your tantrums. And then the other person comes back. You get to change your mind too. But always go to your internal compasses because, yeah, once you start letting the other person decide when you're, it's time to surrender, you've forfeited your free will and, and you're out of your integrity and it can't work. Good question. Jenny says, you know, I keep hearing you say we, but what about those of us who are doing it alone, aching for connection? Loneliness feels so crippling lately when tackling the hard things. Oh, that is really a good point, Jenny. And I am so glad you brought it up and so sorry that you feel alone in this. Like that's one reason I started the gathering room. Uh, I've been so incredibly blessed in my life, but for several decades I felt intensely lonely even when I was around other people like uh, even in a crowded room sometimes especially in a crowded room at Christmas time when everybody around was opening presents I was the loneliest I had ever been in fact I felt less lonely when I went out for walks alone by myself for three or four hours back when I could um so loneliness is like all the other things you have to surrender to it it sucks and it's what's real and then you go to, all right, this really hurts. The loneliness really hurts. And it's begging me to do something about it. I'm going to surrender to this feeling of yearning. And then I'm going to go, oh, okay, acceptance, peace. Um, what was the next one? From peace to uh, gratitude, from gratitude to appreciation, from appreciation to joy. If you do this with loneliness, the thing that has you, which is the desire to love and be loved, will not let you stop trying. 
And that's why loneliness is so incredibly unbearable. We're not meant to be alone. And we're not meant to be alone. Even if we're alone in an apartment, there are, this is where I go out on my own personal belief limb, there are beings waiting for us. I was alone in my apartment. Well, my oldest was asleep in the other room when I sort of fell down on my apartment floor in Cambridge and, and this being was there and had been the whole time. I just hadn't seen it. I knew immediately it had been there the whole time watching me, helping me grieve. And it picked me up in its arms and it was a very, very real experience. And in later years, when I'd get really intensely lonely, I'd be out on the road somewhere. I traveled almost all the time. And um, I literally would just go to the internet and, and Google angels and read about people's angel encounters. And some of them sounded kind of like, mm, I think they made that up. And others were like, oh yeah, oh yeah. And it would take me back. And in that way, I could surrender to my loneliness and then find acceptance and then find um, peace, gratitude, appreciation, joy. And that led me to other humans. And there was a time when I was like, I don't need any humans. I've got, I've got angelic companions. I believe in the, that the universe is conscious. I feel the presence of loving forces around me. I really, really feel it. I don't need people. And then it wouldn't let me. <laughs> the, the force moved me back into human connection. And um, I was willing to give it more tries, many, many more tries. And that's what's going to happen to you with your loneliness. You're, it's going to keep having its way with you. And you're going to have to keep surrendering, letting go, letting go, letting go until it picks you up in grace again. And then you may fall again. And then it picks you up again. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? It's about repetition. All right. So, um, Disenlightened Edit says, what would you tell yourself about accepting a situation while knowing it is wrong and working to change or heal it? Well, I would first of all say, okay, I'm going to be really clear that this is wrong. So if it's a situation where, for example, I'm being mistreated, I'm not going to say it's okay. I'm going to say, no, this is wrong. And I don't like the way I'm going to be, I'm being treated. I have to figure out how to respond. But I live a very entitled life. I've really learned so much um, by watching the whole race reckoning in the U.S. and everything where people who have been mistreated and mistreated and mistreated were stating it more publicly and it hasn't, it's not over. It's not even close to over. I wish it were. We're making a little more progress, I do think, or maybe I'm just trying to make progress myself. This is something that won't let me go. I have to keep working and working and working to change that unjust situation in our culture, in my own mind, in everything around me. I have to just keep trying to make it better. But while it's not better, there are times I still have to sleep. You know, there are times everybody still has to sleep. You might fight against injustice all day long. You still need to get your rest. You still need time to have fun. You still need to read a book sometimes or take a walk. So this surrender process goes on with that too. But never, ever lie to yourself and say the situation is okay. And there may be places where you're in danger if you speak publicly. But if you're not in danger, then speak up for yourself. Um, and then keep working to change the situation from a surrendered place. Okay. Unbelievable Freedom says, the idea that Martha Beck could be discouraged by potty training helps me give myself grace. <laughs> Dude, I am, I am, I'm discouraged by my own potty training, <laughs> let alone another person. Yeah, I, I, I am not a person who has a lot of fortitude. I give up super easily. And then the things that have me keep me going. Thank you, sweetie. That is so kind of you to say. City Lotus says, how can we accept our anxiety when we have to be on or focused for a work task? Maybe you're going to have to surrender to the fact that that work task is not something you can do right then. Um, I, I sent in the manuscript for my last book, The Way of Integrity, the week Manhattan, New York shut down because of the pandemic. Remember that week? It was horrible. There were coffins in the streets. There were people like pouring out the, the doors of hospitals. There were people dying everywhere. 
and all the offices were shutting down and everybody was going to work from home. I sent in a manuscript that week and my editors read it. And when we had our conversations back and forth, well, when I did the rewrite, they kind of said, wow, this is really different than the first time I read it. And I honestly think they did a great job both times, but they were very different. And I think the first time was affected by the fact that everything in the world was going to hell in a handbasket, especially right where they were, and their lives were in total discombobulation. And boy, they came through, they did the work. But it was them working from, I think, the part of the brain that is dealing with huge amounts of change and pressure. And it was really different when they read it again six months later. I had changed things, but also the whole situation had calmed down. So sometimes your work's not going to be the same. Oh my gosh, writing a column for Oprah Magazine every single week for a seventeen or a month for 17 years, I could not always be on, but I always just showed up and I like plod ahead and some of the articles pleased me and some of them really didn't. But I would surrender to the fact that it wasn't going to be a great article that month and on I would go. So Marnie says, I lost my 26-year-old daughter to leukemia last June. Oh, I think you talked to me about or wrote to me about this then. I am still in deep grief. I may have to listen to this a couple of times, but I think there is a message in here. Could this apply to grief? Yeah, this is, it's always about loss. The time we need to let go is always when we've lost something. We've lost steam. We've lost our concentration. We've lost all our money, we've lost our health, and we've lost our loved ones. They just, it, some losses take a little trip around the cycle of grieving, and some of them take years. I think I was really sad for about six years once. Um, that was after I wrote Leaving the Saints and, and folks that I loved weren't happy with me. And for six years, I watched the sadness be processed by my system. And I just surrendered to it over and over and over and over and over again. I don't think it takes six years always. You can be happy in the middle of the grieving process as well. There can be incredible sweetness, incredible gratitude. See if you can get to acceptance and then maybe to peace. And then you may fall again because this is a really, really, really big one. And our hearts are with you, Marnie. That is... It's just unthinkable. So, but it's the same. It's the same process. So Kirsten finally says, how do you start to let go when you don't know what you need to let go? Well, then you keep going. You keep going until you fall down. <laughs> That's how you learn the feeling of, oh, I should stop this now. It's time to surrender. I had to be driven to literally the point of almost physically dying before I would give up when I was in my 20s. I had a lot of fortitude. And then I had lots and lots and lots of pain and loss and whatever. And every time I gave up a little sooner, I learned, I, I think I'm pretty good at giving up. Yeah, it's the one thing I, I maybe have, have practiced the most. And I'm getting a little better at it. And if I'm not very good at it, I'll fail the next time. And that's okay, I'll just surrender to that. Oh, giving up, it's foolproof. You can always do it. And uh, just remember, I'm going to give up now and, and end the session. But just remember, from wherever you are, to acceptance. <sighs> from acceptance, see if you can find a little pocket of peace. From peace, see if there's just one thing you can feel grateful for. Genuinely, not fakey. Genuinely grateful for. From there, you're going to get to appreciation of that thing. And then finally, you'll see joy sneaking in. And it can happen 10 times a day or once every 10 years, but that's how it goes. I love you all so much, and I'm so grateful to you for gathering with me in the room. And I'll see you again soon. End. End. <laughs>